Hey everyone, happy new year, happy Wednesday. This is Birth Prep 101. I'm gonna let y'all load on, then we're gonna get started. So tell me where you're from. I'd love to know where in this world we are all coming together tonight for this hour to be educated. Super excited. All right, California, New York, Connecticut, Kansas City, Missouri, Indonesia. Ooh, this is exciting. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, Ohio, Florida, Delaware. Nice, New Mexico, Nebraska, Kentucky, North Carolina, Canada. Very cool. A couple can Canada's. United Kingdom. Awesome. Germany. It looks like nighttime over there, I think. I must have insomnia. <laughs> Michigan, Melbourne, Australia, DFW. You're in my area. Brazil. More Canada's. Colorado. Y'all are like from all over the place. Chicago. Good. Minnesota. Hello, Houston, Texas. I know that city well. Africa, Brazil. Not sure where that one's from. I can't read that one. It's a different language. United Kingdom, Mexico. Awesome. So we're all over the place. Alabama coming together for this hour of knowledge. I'm going to pass my knowledge on to you. I am Krisha Crosley, Serena Life Doula. I'm a certified birth doula and childbirth educator. I'm also your natural birth trainer. I do natural birth. My passion lies with first time moms and women with the heart of an athlete who desire a home or birth center birthing experience. I am in the Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas area within the United States. And I've been a doula for over nine years. I have been training uh, expecting couples for natural birth for over five years. The Train for Birth program has really grown. I have been married to the love of my life for 26 and a half years, and I also we also have two bigs. We have a son who's 23 years old, and he weighed in nine pounds eight ounces. Woo, that's big baby. <laughs> and he's now six five. He towers over me. I'm only five ten. I know I look short in my videos, but I'm tall, than, taller than average. And we have a daughter who's 22, and she weighed in at 9 pounds, 14 ounces. Woo! And yes, and she's training to go to mid midwifery school. She's starting her third year of midwifery school, so she can become a midwife. I'm a doula. She going to be a midwife. The difference between a doula and a midwife is doulas are not medically trained. Midwives are medically trained. They're the ones who do vaginal checks, check your blood pressure, Take your labs, listen to your baby's heart rate, catch your baby, that type of stuff. I don't do that. Mm -mm. I'm on the outside of the body. Okay? I help labor you down. I help give you resources to make the best educated decisions you can make about your body, your birth, and your baby. And help train you for your birthing game day. So that's hopefully why y'all are here to get started with that. I'm so excited y'all are here and hope everyone's having a great new year so far. Okay? 2023 is going to be a good one. It has a three in it. It's my favorite number. There might be a quiz in the front in the you know in the future, so you might want to remember that. What's Krisha's favorite number? Three. It's prime. It's odd. Three. All right. So um, my philosophy is your body's created to birth your baby, and your body will stress just enough to have your baby. Very physiological process. Your body 100% knows what to do. That is not how we are conditioned. For birth in our society. It is very conditioned in pathology and medical interventions and a lot of us that's all we know. Like 98% of us. And that's 98% of us sign up for class who are birthing in hospitals. We have some home birthers. We have some birth center birthers. But the majority of y'all, 65% who actually registered for class and got the class handout, want a natural birth unmedicated. Okay, so all you hospital birthers are going to need to stay at home and labor as long as possible before you go in. And 
you need to take my train for birth workshop so you know what you're doing like how to train for it how to prepare for it how to knock hours off your labor and then get in there and birth your baby labor that baby across the finish line all right so this is education for you to, for you to make educated decisions you will be offered tons of things and you need to know what to say yes no or can we wait a few minutes right you can do nothing not everything has to have something done but you got to get the information and then decide what you want to do from there birth should not be rushed it is a physiological process your body knows how to do okay most of us are low risk about probably 90 percent of us are low risk but we're treated like we're high risk right but there are a few of us that are truly high risk because of some medical situation and your best place to have a baby is in the hospital because they have the means to take care of you that's important so whether you're having a natural unmedicated birth you plan to labor as long as possible and get your epidural you plan to go in and get an epidural right away or you're planning for a cesarean birth which I didn't have anybody register for that one but someone could join you need to know what to do you need to know what decisions to make and come up with the birth plan it is your decision on your birthing process okay so we're going to cover a few things first the most commonly asked questions I get big baby my baby's too big my baby's measuring small okay so what's your point now too big too small this usually kind of hits in about 36 weeks okay there you've gone great your healthcare providers agreeing yes you can have all that oh this is great and then 36 weeks is like whoop, in the face right well you know you're measuring big you're measuring too small this that um, they're trying to get you on the induction line some providers have hundreds of clients due each month that provider cannot go to every single birth they just can't then there's some midwife groups have four to six rotation so they take they don't take hundreds but they take some more and then you have some individual midwives who will take four to six in a month because that's all they can handle right so what type of practice do you want to be in big babies 1.3 percent will actually have a big baby big baby is nine plus pounds 1.3 percent guess how many are told they're gonna to have a quote-unquote big baby within the United States a third of you for a 1.3 percent that's actually big baby okay that is terminology to get you on the induction line now some of you will truly have a big baby like me I had two big babies and I birthed them vaginally my body opened up and birthed both of them yours can too um, same thing with too small so the important thing I'm gonna give you a little tip you like tips I forgot to tell you I educate first and then I'm gonna open up to a live Q&A afterwards I expect you on a ball because we're going to move and hopefully you have water because we're gonna have moving and water breaks because we gotta start practicing I don't care if you're thinking about getting pregnant you're in first try, second third try we got to start conditioning ourselves water and keeping our bodies moving that's how we stay low risk and keep the aches and pains out okay here's your tip how is your baby measuring on your baby's own growth curve not how baby is compared to every other individual baby and in separate moms it's that baby on that baby's growth curve those are the questions you need to ask if you get scared with big baby or too small baby well how's my baby doing on its own growth curve we are all individually different bodies we're gonna grow different sized babies own growth curve if your baby is on its own growth curve healthy mommy healthy baby labor on stay pregnant okay next one let's talk about dilation all right so I know I've got a lot of first-time mommies on here and we have some second third and I think even saw a couple of fourth come in welcome back you fourth timers there's always more to learn always come back let's talk about dilation so dilation is the opening up of the cervix so that's measured from zero to 10 centimeters where you're open up enough for a baby to pass through doesn't mean that you're 10 centimeters and you start pushing it's just your body's open enough to have a baby so dilation doesn't happen especially for first-time mommies unless you're having contractions 
strong labor contractions. You're going to be over here zero to five for a long time. And then this goes faster because now you're having strong labor contractions. The other thing that cervix has to do is it has to efface, which is thin out, thins out in a percent, opens up, pulls forward. Okay, so the, the cervix is posterior. So your body has to ripen up and start moving forward, start opening up in, and getting thinner. If you're second, third, fourth, tenth time mom, you may walk around four or five centimeters. Kind of common. Your body's done it before, the pressure of the baby, you know, open up. If you first time mommies, don't expect to be opened up. Okay, so let's do a little experiment here. So this is the uterus. And we're going to pretend like this little ball in here is the baby's head. Warning, this is a balloon. And sometimes balloons pop. I've popped one recently, so hopefully this one doesn't pop today. This is your cervix. Okay? So it's closed, shut, it's not opening, and then you start having contractions. You can have contractions low in the uterus, which is early labor, that doesn't do much here. Right? You might dilate one, two, three, possibly four centimeters. It may take 12 hours. That's okay. We're not rushing anything. We're letting your body labor how it's intended to labor. And then the contractions are going to get strong, so they're going to build up. They're going to build up. And then they're going to build even more. And then you're going to start seeing more significant change. So you're going to start opening up. And you're going to start effacing. You'll 100% efface before I hear some noise coming out of this balloon, which is not normal. More. Oh, this balloon has a defect. <laughs> so that's what's happening. It already has a hole in it. So you press, 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 press. You see the change? And you're going to start opening up. Let's we'll see if we can do it without it popping Let's go for it, right? And then I'll throw it away. Now, you're 100% effaced. Now you're going to start to dilate more because of the pressure of the baby's head pressing onto the cervix. Oop, this baby's going to come out ace and lit Tilted head. Oh, there you go. You're going to have so many contractions before your baby's born. What's the number? I have no idea. Okay? You're going to have as many as it takes for your baby to cross your finish line. Number one sign of labor is contractions. I'm going to repeat myself. Number one sign of labor is contractions. What we see in Hollywood is not what happens in 90% of the population. 90% will have contractions first. 10% you'll have that water break first and contractions will start later. Okay? Estimated due date. <clears throat> What's the definition of estimated? It's a guess. Don't expect to have your baby on the estimated due date. There's only 5% of babies who agreed that's their birth date. 95% are going to pick their own day. That's okay. 41, 42 weeks is normal. You, a lot of you are going to be pressurized into being induced at 40 weeks and 41 weeks because, well, you're really late. No, you're not. You're right on time. We're just waiting for your baby to cough that hormonal enzyme to kick off labor with contractions, okay? First time mommies, 41 plus 3 is average. Yes, 41 weeks plus 3 days, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't like pregnant any longer. That's average. So if you're newly getting pregnant, don't tell people your estimated due date. Tell them that plus 3 weeks. So that way, it by the time you're done in pregnancy, people are going to be like, have you had that baby yet? Oh my gosh, you're huge. The baby's not here yet. Are you sure it's safe to go this long? That's going to get in here, and birth is 80% mental. It's just going to keep knocking you back, and then all the hormones you already have going on are going to be heightened, and it's going to be difficult at the end of pregnancy. Uh-uh. Tell them later. Don't tell them. The important people need to know. Handful, whatever. But everybody else can do like, eh, my due date is... March sometime, mid-March, beginning of April, and you're technically due in the February. Get the idea? Helps you be more calm and keeps people out of your DMs, your texts, and all that stuff. Last thing is there's two models of care. 
briefly mentioned that already. There's midwifery care, which is physiological process of birth. And then there's medical care, the medical side, which is pathology. They look for look and look and look for something to doctor, to fix, to procedure, to surgery, to whatever, right? Sometimes this is necessary. Most of us can be over here, okay? But it's up to you. What do you want? What type of provider do you want? What type of environment do you want to have your baby in? Um, hospitals are for sick people. You're having a baby. You're not sick, right? But that's what we're conditioned to believe. Go to the hospital and have a baby, right? So keep that in mind. You have decisions to make. The more education you can get, the better off you're going to be. How to get, how to get the birth you want course, mine, is on sale right now. And the sale ends tomorrow night. So if you haven't taken that course, you should. Or you can also plus buy my booklet, right? PDF or hard copy. It's like a whopping 35 pages, but it is like to the point, nine successful actions expecting parents across the world are doing to get the birth they want. All right, let's get, let's go with these questions. So the handout has been sent out to everyone, okay, multiple times today. 20 questions to ask your healthcare provider. You guys, these questions are not for me. These are for you guys to get your brain turning and thinking of what you need to ask your provider. Whether you're having a home birth, birth center birth, or hospital birth, you need to be talking to your provider. Up front, every time you go, take the questions with you. Take the sheet with you. Put them in your phone. Write on the back some more you have. This is going to start giving you the power and being the captain seat of your birthing desires. That's where I want you. In the captain's chair. Being the captain of your team. Yes, that's great. I don't want that. No thank you to that. Right? Be knowledgeable. That's how you're going to have an empowering birthing experience is being knowledgeable. And if you agree to some things because you feel like that's the best decision for you in the moment, that is totally fine because you made an educated decision. Okay? That's how we stay with a positive, empowering birthing experience and not go into that Ugh, tyrannic we don't want. Nobody wants that. Number one, how long will you let me go past my estimated due date? These are important questions. How long are you going to let me go? Oh, we induced by 40 weeks. Well, what if you want a natural and medicated birth? That's not going to work for you. Might need to find a new provider. Or we're like, well, we're just going to wait. And then we have some states, like the state of Texas, where we run up against a 42-week law. And we got to kind of do stuff before transfer of care has to happen because of a state law. Okay? And then some of us don't have that. So you want to have a provider that has no stipulations on, well, if you're still pregnant, then blah, 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 induce or cesarean. Some people just jump straight to cesarean and there's no induction, right? Let's go in steps here. We're not, it's not an emergency. You're healthy. Your baby's healthy. Why are we rushing? Okay? Two, what should I expect during my labor and delivery experience? Don't just show up and wing it. You're not going to be happy. Okay? Ask them. What's the experience? You want them to break it down and talk to you about this so you can ask more questions so you understand what the process is. For you first time mommies who's never done this before, this is a scary mystery you're about to walk into. It's never happened to you before. You don't know what it's gonna feel like for you. It feels different for everyone or what it is. It takes the mystery out of it which lowers the cortisol levels, which raises the oxytocin levels so you can get that birth going spontaneously. I don't want you in fear. I don't want you stressed or anxious coming up on your birthing game day. So this is what we ask him during my labor, what, what to expect during my labor, delivery and labor experience. Okay? They should go over that with you. If they're like, oh, you'll find out when the day comes, put your shoes on and run. That's not a good sign. Three, what is your philosophy on pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum care? Out of hospital, let me tell you, home and birth centers, those midwives go out in postpartum care two days after birth, two weeks after birth, and again six weeks. And if they need you more, they go out more. So that's three visits at least in postpartum care. OBs, they're like, send you on your way, see you in six weeks. Where's the care right after that first week that's really, really hard and you need help, right? Um, ask what their philosophy is. What is it? Some of their philosophy may be, oh, I like to deliver baby cesarean. Does that agree with you? If not, you need to switch, 
right? I know it's a hassle to switch providers, but I am telling you, this is an experience that you're going to live with for the rest of your life and that you're going to share with any and everybody. You see all the social media posts and shared stories? That will be you sharing some sort of story. So I want you to make it your powerful, positive birthing experience. What is their philosophy? Do you align or are y'all going to do this? If you do this in your prenatal on these questions, you're going to do this in labor. You do not need to be doing this with your birth team in labor. No. Four, when do I recommend coming to the hospital birth center during labor? So your contraction pattern is start of one contraction to the start of the next. Right? That's how you time them. In a hospital setting, it's going to be 5-1-1 pattern. Five minutes apart, lasting a minute each for a complete hour. Okay? Start to start, five minutes. One minute for entire hour. That's too early. I am telling you that's too early, especially for you first time mommies. Second, but first time it's too early. Three to four minutes, lasting a minute, over a minute. For hour two is more what needs to happen. That's a baby getting lower and lower and your body really taking off. Okay, so you need to labor home as long as possible. So ask your provider what it's like. Okay, bounce on your ball or stand up and move your hips. I don't want you slouching or leaning back in your bed too long or couch. And let's take drink some water. Hydration is important. Half your body weight in ounces of water every single day. Most of you, that's between 80 and 100 ounces. And if you're in a liters, it's two and a half to three liters. All right. So what happens, or what should I do if my water breaks suddenly? The pup didn't like that one. <laughs> At home. Well, we could have the Hollywood entrance into labor where your water breaks first. Or we could have maybe this. This is a trickle. This is a high leak. It starts and stops and starts and stops and starts and stops. Sometimes the waters break like that. It's a break that's higher up here and it kind of trickles downward as the baby moves, as you change positions, okay? Um, depending on your provider, depends on what the answer will be, okay? Some will be, oh, we'll just go back to bed or rest and keep me, pro pro uh, keep me updated on progress when the contractions start. And then you have some that will be like, hurry up now, get here, quick, 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 run, 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 run. Okay, that's a little obsessive, but they will tell you to hurry up and get here now. Okay? Keep, keep track of your baby movements. Put an adult diaper on because you're going to continue to leak. The amniotic fluid's coming out. And have this conversation ahead of time so you know exactly what to do when it gets there. Six. Now, I'm actually going to do a little sidebar here. I have a Train 10 Club. Right now it's $4.99. It's members only per month. And on that Train 10 Club, it is my platform. So I can speak pretty freely and more freely than I do on these lives in social media platforms because we are censored and monitored based on what comes out of our mouth. So I am much more real and watch, don't watch how I word things in that Train 10 Club. So if you really want the raw, real stuff, <laughs> consider joining the Train 10 Club. I do lives in that weekly, two to three lives every single week from trying to conceive, first, second, third trimester, uh, labor and delivery, postpartum breastfeeding baby care, Krisha's Natural Ways, it's all in there, okay? It's a whole thing. So you can consider that, okay? Um... Six, do you routinely break water to speed up labor? You guys, breaking your water does not speed up labor. Does it intensify your contractions? Oh yeah, right? So they want to break your water when you're over here. Our bodies, with the natural birth process, have break over here. Eight, nine, ten, boom, we're having a baby. I see the water break so many times over here. Undisturbed birth, meaning no vaginal checks, no membrane sweeps, nothing. And mom breaks water over here, boom, we're having a baby. I see this all the time. It's not what we hear. 
in the social media and stuff. But I do. I see it most of the time. But when you get induced or maybe you get there a little bit too early and you're ready to go in or maybe you decided you want to have your epidural, whatever, they try to break the water over here. No. Don't do that. That's a protectant barrier around your baby. It protects your baby while it's in utero through labor. It will break when it's intended to break. Okay? Let it break when it's intended to break. If it breaks early, over here, and let's say 12 hours, 14 hours later, you're only here, they're going to start going risk of infection. Risk of infection. Well, they gave you that risk of infection by breaking your water. Because they took your baby's protected coat away from your baby. Leave your baby protected as long as it needs to be. If it breaks early, it breaks early. But that's when it's intended to break. Okay? Seven. Oh, can I change positions in labor and push in different positions? Yes, it's your birthright. Yes. Are you going to be allowed to? Birth center births, home births, and some hospital births, yes. But most of you, nope. They're going to word it in a way that you think you have to be on your back with your knees wide. Listen to the wording. And it's hard because y'all are in the throes of labor. You shouldn't have to decide that. This is where partner advocacy is important, right? You and your partner need to be on the same page. That way when you can't talk, your partner can your birth rights. Yes, change positions. Yes, move. Movement wiggles your baby through the pelvis a lot faster than laying on your back being still. It actually causes, especially when you get epidurals, it causes the baby, your muscles relax and your body relaxes so much and you're on your back that the baby rotates backward and now you've got a posterior baby that's trying to come out of the pelvis. This is a posterior baby. So this is the front of the pelvis. This is the baby that looks forward and now the baby has settled like this, right? And now you're trying to push the baby through like this on a heel, like this. Plus it's harder. The, the head doesn't mold how it needs to be molded. So we need to be upright. We need to be in hands and knees. This is also an upright position. So our babies rotate forward where the head, the occiput back here where you have the soft spots can mold and fit through the pelvis. See how much easier that is? It is important to move. It is important to pick the birthing position that you want to birth your baby in. And if that is on your back, okay, so be it. At least you're educated and you made that decision. Okay? But I'm seeing most moms hands and knees for natural birth. Eight, do you offer continuous fetal monitoring or intermittent monitoring? So out of the hospital, you're going to have intermittent monitoring. So that little microphone looking thing with the coil in the box, that's going to be what your baby's going to be monitored with. Intermittent, all the time. They're going to listen closer the closer you get to having your baby. In a hospital setting, they're going to try to hook you up to a machine so you have to stay in or around your bed. Limit your movement. But most of us don't need continuous monitoring. If you have any sort of medication, yes, you will need continuous monitoring because the medication will affect the baby and they need to pay attention to your baby. But if you are going natural and not and you're healthy, you're healthy and your baby's healthy, you do not need to stay on the monitors. In a hospital, there's a disc that's up here for uterus and contractions, and there's one lower that's for baby's heart rate. When you come in, they're going to want a 20-minute strip. That's a piece of paper that prints out of the machine to make sure baby's okay. And then you say, I want to walk around, change positions. Okay? Um, and you're off for a while. You're back on for 20 minutes. You're off for in a while. These things are a headache. I didn't like when I was in, the, in a hospital setting over five years ago because the nurse was constantly in there chasing baby because baby moves. Baby moves a lot in labor. So you, it's hard to get a 20-minute strip and you have to be still and you have to sit a certain way and then blah, 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 right? So think about it. If you don't want to be monitored all the time and you're low risk, you need to talk to your provider about that. Sometimes it's hospital policy. Hospital policy is continuous monitoring forever who checks in and comes in. Maybe the doctor's hands are tied. Do you know your hospital's policies? Okay. You don't have these issues out of hospital. What are your induction methods? Ooh. What is my bishop score and is my cervix favorable for induction? So we're going to do 9 and 10 together. Okay. So 
speak my piece about this right now. I'm going to go on a little rant. <laughs> I don't rant very often. So, I get so many DMs about how do I induce labor? Naturally. Why? Why do we want to induce labor naturally? What is the reason that's going on? Um, I don't know your case. I haven't been following you. I don't know what's going on. Um, but why are we rushing it? We're waiting for your baby to pick their birthday. Literally. They cough an enzyme that sends a signal to your brain. Let's get running. Okay? That's what we're waiting on. Yeah, I get it. You're tired of being pregnant. I understand. Remember I carried over two and a half pound babies for nine months each. I get it. Been there. Done that. Um, but your baby's not ready. Your baby has not kicked off labor. And this is training you and teaching you that your life is about to revolve around this kid or kids at least until you're 18. My kids are 23 and 22. And let me tell you, it ain't stopped yet. <laughs> um, so natural inductions, no. If you do it 38 weeks, 39 weeks, 40 weeks, and 41 weeks, you are still pregnant. And now you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to do something. Mm, do you think it's going to work? No, your body is now used to it. Do not use it until you absolutely have to. So in the state of Texas, that's like about 41 plus 5. That gives us 48 hours to get a baby out before 42-week mark and they have to transfer out of care into a hospital care, right? That's just a state law. I know there's other states in the U.S. that have that as well. Um... Just don't do it. Wait. Let your body like do its own thing. It knows its own thing. You don't even have to do none of that stuff. You don't have to eat dates. You don't have to do raspberry leaf tea. You don't have to do evening primrose oil. All the things you don't have to do. Your body knows. It's trusting the process that your body knows. Now, if you have to be induced, let's say for a medical reason, because you know medical reasons are a reason to be induced, because we want to make sure we have a healthy mommy and healthy baby. There's several things that can be done. One, if your cervix is opened a little bit, uh, they can be doing stripping of membranes, which is just, they stick their fingers in, it's a vaginal check, and they stick it through the cervix. Your cervix has to be open for them to get fingers in there, and they strip the top part of the cervix, which is underneath the baby's head, okay? And this can cause prostaglandin release, which can communicate to the brain, hey, raise your oxytocin levels, may kick you over into labor. You'll have a lot of discharge, mucusy, a little bit of bloody streaks come out from doing that. That's one way. The other way is a Foley bulb, where they put Foley bulb, um, there's one other name, which I'm going blank on, where they put a, um, a Foley up in here, and then they air it up or put water on it. I think, I think Cook's catheter is the other one. Um, and it opens your cervix to possibly three or four. Could kick you over into labor. Okay, so those are like the least kind of um, non-drug ways. There's also some, some type of sticks. Also, there's a word for it. I can't remember what it is right now that they can also put up there if there's no like Foley bow. Okay, then you have the medication. So that's Cytotec, Cervidil, Prostaglandin gel, or the one we know the most, Pitocin. So these are what causes contractions to happen. Um, Cytotec and Cervidil can make you crampy, supposed to soften and ripen your cervix, and then possibly get contractions and kick you over. Now remember, this is a jump start into labor. So you can be going from no contractions to wham, 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 contractions all of a sudden, right? And it kind of throws you off because you didn't have that natural, gradual climb that your body would do spontaneously. Usually they soften with Cytotec, Cervidil, or Prostaglandin gel. Could be mouth, could be up by the vagina, depending on which one it gets. And then followed would be Pitocin. Or they could use Pitocin to augment labor if you're already having contractions and now they're trying to speed things up. These are in hospital, okay? Um, or for, for some reason your care gets transferred into a hospital, these could be things that could happen. Um, those are getting induction going. Now, if you are contemplating being induced and it's a non-medical reason, your provider is going to be out of town and you really want your provider to deliver you, or maybe your spouse has to go out of town, or maybe you're going to have family in town from this day to this day, or whatever, right, non-medical reason, you want to ask what your bishop score is, okay? Is your cervix favorable or unfavorable for, for induction? 
If that bishop score is low, six or lower, uh, it decreases your chance of having a vaginal birth. If it's above, it increases it, okay? So bishop score is a scoring system after your vaginal check to see how ripe you are. Is your cervix open or is it closed? Is your cervix thick or hard? Is your cervix effaced any soft? Um, is it cervix still posterior or anterior? It's a, it's a scoring system, okay? Um, so if you're zero and firm, your bishop score is very low. Likelihood of you getting a vaginal birth is very low. But if you walk in and you're like four centimeters, you've had some labor contractions on and off, you're nice, soft, and you're ripe down there, you might do well for induction and higher chance of having a vaginal birth. If you're going to have an epidural, likelihood of increasing your vaginal birth is get to six centimeters. That's usually where most moms tap because that's when active labor hits and it like really kind of goes up into the next level. Um, that would be a great goal to reach for if you're planning to go that route, okay? So check your bishop score. So also on this one, and I get this question a lot all the time and it blows my mind about vaginal checks in pregnancy. We do not need vaginal checks in pregnancy. Are you in labor? What did we learn about the, the you know, the balloon and the ping pong ball that shot at you? Are you having contractions? You're probably not dilated. If you are to one, okay, great, right? You don't need vaginal checks in pregnancy. They make it sound like they're required. They're not. Lay down, let me check you. Well, let's see what you're at today. You can say, no, thank you. Let's leave it undisturbed. You run the risk of having your water broken, having some discharge coming out, and it's uncomfortable, okay? If you want one and you have to know, that's fine. But for those of you who are like, ooh, I don't look forward to that, you don't have to. You can say no thank you. It's another way to get on an induction line or cesarean line. Now, if you feel like you're having some sort of issue or problem, okay, then you might want to do something about that to ease your mind, okay? So, vaginal checks are not necessary in pregnancy or labor. But you didn't know that, huh? but they make it seem like it. In a hospital setting, they want to check you every four hours because someone arbitrarily decided it was four hours. Mm -mm. Out of hospital, if you want to check, you ask for it, okay? It's an option, option, option. Hopefully y'all's minds are like, oh, this is so cool, okay? 11, nope, just kidding, yeah, 11. Is having a routine hep lock or IV required? Is it? Is it hospital policy? Is it something routine your doctor does? We don't know. Maybe you're scared to death of needles. You don't want to be pricked. You might want to ask. Okay? Ball, bounce, move, change position, drink your water. Are you comfortable with me eating and drinking in labor? Yes. Your body needs fuel, food to burn. Your body needs water to burn. This, you can't have anything to eat and drink in labor. Maybe you're in labor for 24, 36 hours. You don't go 24 to 36 hours without eating every day, do you? And you're not in labor. Why are we doing in labor? You're working hard. You're burning lots of calories. You need fuel. You need water. They're setting you up for surgery. Eat. Drink. Okay? We do this out of the hospital all the time. Feed, drink, feed, drink, feed, drink entire labor so you have energy hospital setting a lot of you could be hospital policy maybe your doctor you need to find out okay eat before you go in i don't care if it's a few bites eat before you go in and take your stash with you your stash with you your little cooler for both of you you both need to eat okay you got to keep your strength up keep the things running lack of food and lack of water can stall labor you're not progressing your body's hungry. Your body's thirsty. It can't function without food and water. And here's my analogy I like to give y'all. Let's just say we have some friends that go out to a dinner and one of them drives home and something happens on the way home, end up needing emergency, emergency surgery. Do you think they're going to go, oh, I'm sorry, when was the last time you ate? Oh, you just say, I'm sorry, we can't do the life-saving procedure on you. Do you think they're going to say that? Absolutely not. 
These people are skilled and trained in emergencies. They're going to take care of you and anything that should happen in that moment. Okay? They are trained, skilled, and we're thankful for them when we need them for trained emergencies. Okay? Eat and drink. It's okay. Just be honest the last time you did. Okay? 13. If I desire an all natural birth, are you willing to support me in that? Hmm. Has your provider seen a natural birth experience? Has your provider seen an unmedicated experience? People coming out of school right now, OBs, they've never seen a natural birth unmedicated because they're not trained in it. They're trained into how to intervene routinely and standardly to have a baby, not natural birth. Now, if you're wanting a cesarean, you need to find a provider that does cesareans. High cesarean rate, because that doctor likes to deliver babies via cesarean. That would be great if you're wanting a cesarean birth as your birth. If you're wanting epidural birth, you want a doctor proficient in epidurals. Or, anesthesi or a hospital has an anesthesiologist, so you get the epidural working well and one time. Okay, There are side effects to the epidural, so you all need to make sure you do your research on that. I don't cover that in this class. That's what a full childbirth education class is for. And then if you want unmedicated natural birth physiology process, you need to match your provider with that who has seen it and does it all the time. That's more along the midwifery lines. And there are some OB, OBs that do that as well. Okay? You want that support, especially in the moment. Okay? 14, what is your cesarean rate and hospital cesarean rate? Okay? These are important. What is the hospital's rate? What is your provider's rate? Backup provider. Right? There's groups of uh, OBs, midwives that work in a hospital. You want to know what that is. Make sure you're in the right place. Our cesarean right, rate in the United States is high. 34%? That's high. That's unnecessary cesareans that are equaling that. We've grown over 500% since 1970. That's a lot. Okay? Number one performed surgery in the United States? Cesareans. Whew, it's a lot. It's a third. It's way too much. Educating y'all is what's going to help lower that. Okay, y'all get this educated information and y'all go out and use it and apply it. Okay, is performing episiotomies part of your routine delivery? Uh, I've never seen an episiotomy out, out of hospital. I'm sure they are done in emergencies, but it's very, very rare. I think in the United States, they have gotten a lot less and they're not performed so much, but you know, you have some doctors that are still in their routines. There are countries, I do know like India, and there's one other country, I think it's Iraq or Iran, I can't really remember, um, in the Middle East area that has a high level of episiotomies because that's how those doctors are trained and that's one of the most fearful things to do in that area. So I have talked to two OBs in India, um, one of them, which has been a few months now, actually maybe longer, a year now actually, um, episiotomies are not required in India, but they do push them. So you have the right to say no thank you if you live in India. And I also just had an OB, actually I trained my first OB, trained for birth workshop <laughs> from India and I'm super excited. So she is now having her patients do my train for birth workshop. And I probably, for you that live in India, I probably need to find out where in India so y'all know where this OB is because she is into the natural birth and getting her expecting parents trained up to have birth. It's exciting, making a difference. So an episiotomy is scissors. Pretend like these are scissors. And then this is your vagina, right? So it's anterior this is your perineum and this is your rectum anus where the skin right here between the bottom of the vagina down to the anus is called your perineum and when the baby emerges your perineum drops downward like this right and so the anus shifts back a little bit and then the perineum moves backwards so sometimes they take a pair of scissors and they cut the bottom of the vagina down towards the anus to open up the the hole a little bit more um, again, your body will stretch just enough to have your baby. Okay. That's my philosophy. And if it doesn't, it does tear a little bit, but it will heal. A for sure cut's a for sure cut. It's not even a chance. Okay. Um, you can talk to your provider about that. 
What is your on-call schedule? What is the likelihood you will deliver my baby? If you're in a practice of 13 doctors, you have the chance of maybe two days out of the year or out of the month that they're on call. The likelihood of getting your doctor is not very much, okay? Or if you have smaller practices, you have more likelihood, okay? So check what the on-call schedule is. Will they deliver the baby or possibly not? Will that person come in if you go into labor on an off-call through the office, right? How dedicated is this person to you? Does your backup have similar philosophy of delivering babies as you? If you love your provider and that provider can't be there, does their backup handle you the same way that you love about your primary care person, right? This is important. You could have a great provider and then something happens. Maybe they have a family emergency or something and they can't make it, whatever the reason is. You still want to be cared for for what you've been conditioned for through pregnancy, right? All right. Is delayed cord clamping routine and for how long? So delayed cord clamping, this is important, you guys, and we're being robbed of this. Actually, your babies are. So when your baby comes out, your baby is still connected to the umbilical cord and the placenta is still inside of your body, okay? And it pulses. So 30% of your baby's blood is still in the placenta. That is your baby's blood. Your baby only has two-thirds of the blood in the body at birth. Third is in the placenta. So that blood needs to pump into your body. Our bodies are phenomenal when it comes to birth. Okay? You and baby's body work great together. So allow the placenta to pump the blood into your body. A minute is too short. Average is three to five minutes. Sometimes it takes ten, but three to five minutes is average. Let the cord, it'll go white. It comes out real purpley and like spirally. And then it'll go white and it quits pulsing. That's a great time to cut if you want. Or you can deliver the placenta first and then remove it later if you want. Okay? But let your baby have that. It's important. Your body need your baby needs those red blood cells. And not to mention there's a high concentration of stem cells that need to go into your body, your baby's body as well. Okay? Delayed cord clamping. Please start yes for that. Is skin to skin with my baby immediately after birth routine? It should be, right? Let's think about this. We're mammals, right? And other mammals birth babies. So if you were to birth your baby, let's just say on the side of the road, are you just going to leave your baby in the dirt? Even the mammals will start licking their baby, comforting their baby, cleaning their baby up, giving them some kind of love and share, or snuggling around their baby, the pictures we've seen. Your baby needs to be here. Your boobs are an incubator. You're going to control your baby's temperature, your baby's heart rate, your baby's oxygen levels, scent bonding with your baby. You need your baby here for you. Deliver your placenta. The involution of your uterus containing a baby to coming back needs to happen. Your baby moving on your breast stimulates your brain for your milk production to come in. It stimulates your brain for your uterus to contract. This is important. So important, and it's not talked about enough. Simply having your baby here can decrease your chances of having postpartum hemorrhage and clotting issues. Babies here. Your baby does not need to be weighed in the first hour of its life. It's going to weigh the same three hours later than it does right after birth. They're, most of them are just trying to move to the next room. Out of hospital, it's usually done right before the midwife leaves or you go home from the birth center, which is three or four hours later, okay? Please leave your baby here for you. Your postpartum bleeding, it helps with your body. It's part of the process. Our babies need to be here, and y'all need to start speaking up more about it so we can change this to a new normal. Y'all need your babies here. We all need our babies here, okay? Okay, rant over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's 20 questions. It's 20 questions to get you thinking, to ask. Come up with your own. These are just trying to get you going to think about it. Write them down because whoo, pregnancy brain is real. This is the handout. You should have all gotten it if you registered. It's in your inbox. It's been gone out multiple times today. If it's not in your inbox, check your spammer promotions. It could be in there. Okay? So I'm going to start opening up for questions now. 
So in, I usually do Instagram first and then I do Facebook because sometimes Instagram cuts me off um, in an hour and sometimes they don't. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so things I got going on. Um, this class will be up for 24 hours because I know there's people on the other side of the world sleeping that have registered and want to see it. So I keep it up for 24 hours. If your partner's not here, your partner needs to re-watch re it too. Y'all need to watch it together. Um, this is not a full childbirth education class. You need a full childbirth education class. Okay? This is not enough to make it. If you want an unmedicated natural birth, you need to train for it. Train for birth workshop. I have it virtually. You have six months access to it. 34 plus weeks is when you can start your training. So third trimester is good. So if you're due now, February or March into April, it's on sale until tomorrow. In the day tomorrow, it goes off sale. So that's my virtual training. There's 107 videos. It's about three hours of content. Great information if you want a natural birth. Okay? Train for it. Get into the know. Don't be surprised. Okay? How to get the birth you want. If you're first trimester, second trimester, this is the class you need to take now. Okay? It's also on sale. This is all my Christian Crosley Academy. The Ultimate Postnatal Bundle. It's also on sale. Postpartum. Breastfeeding. Baby Care 101s. Go get the information. Postpartum breastfeeding baby care is not educated enough or stressed enough like it is with birth, birth preparation. You've got to get the information so you know what's going on. Don't wait till you're holding your baby. It's going to be too late. Those are all on sale. And then again, I have my Train 10 Club, $4.99 a month. You can become a member. And I, go, I do lives, a lot of personal stuff in that, and speak my mind. <laughs> okay. Um, if you want an, uh, a power hour with me, call the 60, uh, it's called a coach it. It's a 60 hour power session. You want to go over your birth plan. You want to go over, well, my doctor said this, or what, what do I need to ask? Or can I have some tips about getting rid of pubic bone pain or SI joint pain or whatever? Those are coach it's hour, 60 hour, just kidding. 60 minute power session with me. Those are available as well. And I also do virtual private training for births. If you're in my area, come train with me in person at the Fort Worth Birthing and Wellness Center. Or I'll come out to your home and train you privately. <sighs> All right. Oh, and then I forgot again. My booklet. This is great, you guys. A lot of people are having great wins on it. How long can you go without having to worry about thread of meconium spell check? Oh, <laughs> meconium. It's spelled correctly. With going 40 plus weeks. Meconium is one of those things. That means the baby's digestive system is fully functional. The baby had to go poop and couldn't wait to come out. It's made a huge bigger deal out of than it actually is in certain environments. Okay? So, I personally wouldn't worry about that. You can go as long as you need to before your baby's born. Because you're not going to know that your baby's pooped in the womb until you get into labor and your water breaks. Uh, okay, I'm also not medically trained, so I will not answer any medical questions. So I'm going to keep scrolling on that. And if I don't get to your question tonight, then I will put up tomorrow um, Q&A answer from Birth Prep 101. And we'll finish it on Instagram feed. And it usually kicks over to my Facebook story as well. I think I already answered that one. What are my thoughts on stretching your perineum? Absolutely not. Do you know what you're doing? If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. You can overstretch, stretch the muscles too much. You can add bacteria into the vaginal canal, and now your baby has to come through that. It, I don't recommend it. If you have a professional that knows how to do it, that's fine. What if the cord is wrapped around the baby and they want to cut it immediately? Well, they can unloop the baby's cord around whatever. They don't need to cut it right away. They, they need to have the skill set of taking, when the baby's head come out, I don't have my other, here, oh, I do have my own pelvis. Here, let me show you. Okay, so this is my skinned pelvis. So when the baby's head comes out, Let's just say the cord's wrapped around the neck. I'm assuming that's what you mean because that's pretty common. Pretty common. Right? 
So the baby comes out and you, they see the cord, right? So the shoulders haven't even been delivered. So as soon as they see the cord, what I see done at birth is they just slip the cord around the baby's head like this. And then the shoulders come out and the baby's born. It's no longer looped. And then the baby can still be connected. Oh, y'all are answering each other's question. That's what I love. With good answers. Good job. Thanks for helping. Now, ba loops around the neck are very common, especially one nuptial. That's one loop around the neck with the umbilical cord. That's not a reason for a cesarean. It's very common. Okay, the live will be up for 24 hours. You're welcome. Uh, I highly recommend placenta encapsulation, um, especially if you've had history of depression in the past, and it helps with your iron levels, helps with your milk production, helps replace the hormones that your body's gonna dump four to five days after postpartum, and overall helps with recovery. So I do encourage it um, if it's something you're interested in and it's offered in your area. Yes, natural delivery is possible with fibroids. There may be some that could be too low by the cervix that could block, um, but it really depends on where your fibroids are, but you can have natural delivery. It just depends on where they are for you. It's not always the same for everybody, but it's still possible. Vitamin K, there is a article, an evidence-based birth that you can go read to help you make a decision on that. It's a personal choice, so you need to do your research on that. And Birthing Instincts also has a podcast on it as well. I saw your prenatal exercises. Which program is that on? I have prenatal exercises in my Train for Birth workshop for 34 plus weeks. I have a training program written out for 34 plus weeks. I'm in the process of writing a prenatal program for the entire pregnancy. I'm about halfway done, but I'll have that out sometime this year. Oh gosh. I get this one every class. This one just infuriates me. <laughs> oh. Maternal age being high risk. Absolutely not. <laughs> Nothing wrong with my baby and I don't want to induce 39 weeks. Thoughts? If you're healthy and your baby's healthy, stay pregnant. No, they're just, that's not, no. I have clients, I have two clients right now. One is 40 and one is 44. And they're both birthing in a birth center. Drink your water. Message me, and I will send you a great podcast to listen on that, and it's going to change your mind. It's going to actually give you, like, comfort on that. Train for birth is, um, what I do is I cover what the natural birthing process is, how your hips and your body are going to respond based on where your baby's located, what exercises to do to condition your body and your mind for your birthing game day. And then the program, you go home and you start uh, doing the exercises to get your body ready and conditioned for a baby to go through the pelvis. So it's both. If I'm a hands-on type of workshop, we go through all the exercises and I correct people's like knees in, knees out, lunge this way, lunge that way. It's a little bit harder virtually, but I still cover everything. 
and then you go and you, you practice. It's practice, practice, practice. Don't expect to take train for birth and work out one time in it to work. It's all about conditioning the body. If you're an athlete, you know this. You do things over and over and over again so your body responds how you want to in the moment you need to use it for that sport. Same thing with birth. If you condition your body and the movements that you're already going to do naturally, it's going to make it a lot easier than if you don't do that. I work the program backwards, so I observe natural childbirth and then watch what the moms are doing and then work the program with the exercise based on what natural birthers were doing in labor. The squats, the lunges, getting upside down, sitting forward, doing this, doing that. That's what it does. That's how I wrote the program. Blood pressure issues is a medical reason. Should your doctor induce your pregnancy in an older age? No. If you're healthy and your baby's healthy, there's no reason to. How much are the co coaching sessions? For a power hour right now, I have them at $99. Those are on sale now, and I have availability as early as tomorrow if you desire. Depends on our time zones. Um... But that's what they are for right now. Um, well, okay, placenta previa is a cesarean birth. If your placenta is covering your cervix, right? So if your placenta is covering your cervix, the baby can't come through that because it's blocked. And when your cervix starts to open, the blood starts coming out of the placenta, and therefore your baby has no um, oxygen and blood transfer. So you will have a cesarean early, so this would be important. This is complete previa. If you have partial previa, so there's just like a little piece, and they find it early enough that that placenta can move anterior off of the cervix and then you can open up for a vaginal birth which is usually known about 28 weeks um, but if it's complete previa you will have a cesarean birth that is a medically necessary reason to have a cesarean birth and you um, need to find the most like-minded best cesarean doctor to do it so that's family centered um, or gentle cesarean, so you get skin to skin in the OR, you get to ride back to your room with the baby here, uh, you might get to deliver your own baby, there's a lot of things centered around the family um, versus it not, okay? Let me grab a few of these Facebook ones. God, time goes so fast. Let me see the... Oh, I already did those. So if you're having a home birth, I highly recommend getting a birth ball and a peanut ball. Um, if you're at least get a birth ball, because those are something you can use and exercise with, and Train for Birth Workshop shows you how to use it as well if you do that. Um, but I have an Amazon store, Serena Life Doula, it's the link in Instagram, I'll post it after I'm done on Facebook, um, that you can go and has all my recommends for everything. Pregnancy, postpartum, baby care, breastfeeding, birth training, everything. But yes, I, it's worth the investment to get an exercise ball. Get the anti-burst ones. If you want to do placenta encapsulation, can you still do delayed core clamping? Yes. Oh, thank you, Alika. That's great. Um, it, can you message me? Oh, I have, uh, actually, I need your zip code, and then I can send you doula recommendations in your area. If you want doula recommendations in your area, you need to send me a DM with your city-state zip, and then I can try and find you some in that area. How early should I get an exercise ball? I'm currently eight weeks long. You can use an exercise ball your entire pregnancy if you want, but at least by 34 weeks. Do you recommend expressing colostrum before labor in 39 weeks and 3 days? I don't recommend it unless you know you're having a baby that's going to have to go into the NICU or Children's Hospital. 
then you can collect it. If you're producing so much colostrum at the end of pregnancy, it's leaking all over your shirt and stuff, like a lot, you might want to collect it because it's better. You can use it for your baby than have it all over your clothing. But if you're not leaking at all, it's okay. Not everybody leaks in pregnancy um, or leaking a little bit. You don't want the nipple stimulation. Nipple stimulation can cause contractions and you have more contractions and then you're not ready to have a baby yet. Um, so it really depends on what you got going on. Oh, here's another one I always get asked. At 39 weeks and 4 days, my doctor wants to strip the membranes. 2 centimeters dilated last visit. Would you advise against it? Yes. Why are we stripping membranes? It increases your chances of your water breaking. You guys, there's... I did a survey a while ago, but, and also, we're also noticing this along the birth world as well. I don't know the exact resource for it. I'd have to look for it, but any type of manipulation in the vaginal canal or the cervix is going to increase that water rupturing in the next 24 hours. If your baby's not ready to be born, you're going to have a water break and your body's not going to respond. Your baby coughing that hormonal enzyme is what causes your brain to raise hormone levels to go into labor. So then you're broken 12 hours, 24 hours. Then they're going to want to induce or augment because nothing's happening. Okay? That's not... Unmedicated birth is out the window. So stripping of membranes is one of those things that can be used. But personally, it's my opinion... It's not something you want to do until you're running up like a state law, against a state law, 41 plus 5. 39 weeks is too early for stripping of membranes for most of us. Good question. For the three to four minute, for the one hour guideline, is that suggested with a 20 minute hospital drive or longer? Yes. First time moms, more than likely, will have time to get to the hospital. Or if not, you're gonna have a car baby. Okay, fine. My car babies and people not making it to the birthing environment has increased with training for birth. But it's 20 minutes is not something to stress about getting to the hospital. If she's on the ground, hands and knees, and she's not getting up, she has constant rectal pressure, she's moaning loudly and kind of uh, 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 grunty, then you might want to hurry up because the baby's about to be pushed out of her body. You may not make it at that point. But three to four minutes apart, guideline, yes, you'll have plenty of time for first-time mom. Train for birth workshop. It's currently $199. That's the virtual one. We have six months access to it because it also has some postpartum stuff in it. If baby is breech position at 38 weeks, should we go for C-section? No. Why? Is your baby sick? Is you, are you unhealthy? Breach is a variation of normal. It's not a reason for a C-section. Providers are not being trained on how to deliver breech babies. So they automatically putting breech moms or moms with a breech off into C-section to have a surgery. If this is your first baby, you want a vaginal birth. Do you plan to have more children? Because in a lot of places, once a cesarean, always a cesarean, especially in some of our countries. It's not true. Okay? So, one, you can do exercises to help rotate baby. You can see a Webster certified chiropractor. You can see a pelvic floor therapist. Loosen up your pelvic floor and try to get baby to rotate. Babies know to be head down. There's only 3 to 4% that will be born breech because they know it's safer to stay breech. Babies are super smart. Or you go and find you a provider that can deliver a vaginal baby breech. Those would be my options. Unless you're educated enough now. No, you're educated enough that you feel comfortable delivering your baby breach via cesarean.
It's your choice, but it's not, does not, breach does not equal cesarean. Primrose oil pills inside vagina, there's not enough research on that. And I think with this natural stuff, if you think it's going to work, it's going to work. If you think it's not going to work, don't even try it. Don't do something because somebody else said to or be, it worked for somebody else. If you're like, oh, uh, you had doubts about it, it ain't going to work for you. You already decided in your head it's not working. That's not a funny question. It's actually a good question. Funny question. But what foods do you recommend eating during labor to keep us going? Things with carbs. You're going to eat fast burning calories. You protein meal afterwards. You can do um, any type of pastas. Preferably not acidic stuff like red sauce or um, orange juice because that will like throw up. It'll burn your esophagus through labor. You don't want that. Cottage cheese, um, potatoes, granola bars, nuts, cheeses, uh, a sandwich, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, nut butters are all great to eat. Uh, if you have gestational diabetes, just eat a meal on your on what you're already eating on your diet so we don't have blood sugar issues. And then when it gets in the act of labor and you're not feeling like you're eating very much, then eat a couple of bites of something every 30 minutes. It's partner's job to remind them. And drink lots of water. Please, please, please drink a lot of water in early labor. I am not joking. If you get dehydrated like this, your contractions are going to hurt 10 times worse. You're going to go into the hospital and just swear you're about to have a baby because your contractions are three to four minutes apart on top of each other, lasting a minute and a half. You, you swear you're going to have a baby. You walk in and you get checked, you're two centimeters. That's dehydrated contractions. They're going to run a bag of fluids, 33 ounces. You're going to get all this hydration in your body and your contractions are going to space 10 minutes apart. And now you're there because you're admitted and they're going to start doing interventions. Drink your water. That's why we're practicing drinking water now. Your body has to run and function. Okay? How can you prepare before even being pregnant? I love that y'all are here getting this education. I go over all that in my Train 10 Club. Um, really, uh, you want to take at least three months to prepare before you try to get pregnant. I go over like the protocol for the detox of the body to really like, get your body ready. You need to already be exercising and you need to start cleaning up your diet if you haven't already. Those would be my main tips for just for tonight. If you're told the baby's stuck in the pelvis, how to avoid a C-section, then movement. You've got to keep your body moving and change your position. Get off your back if you're on your back. The live can be accessed on my Facebook and uh, Instagram platforms in the next 24 hours. You're very welcome. Awesome. Yep, I believe it. Any recommendations for first time VBAC? You need to get your cesarean massage done, whether it's a pelvic floor therapist or there are professionals who are trained in massage, massage for cesarean scar. Um, it's important. Because you've had a major abdominal surgery, scar tissue and adhesions happen, and that's why women later down the road, 6, 8, 10, 15, 20 years later, have back pain, have incontinence, have just pulls and strains in their hip growings and stuff like that. That's from that abdominal surgery. It's the adhesions and the scar tissue, and different bodies can produce more which can cause more problems. So you want to get that area loosened up so your uterus has time to expand and you don't have that tightness down there also so you can have a well-positioned baby so that's one thing seeing a Webster certified chiropractor get information on having a VBAC making sure you have a supportive VBAC provider if your providers like oh we'll see 
That's not supportive. Your provider should go, we're going to get this V back. Let's set you up for success. Let's do this. You want that person on your team. Swelling in the feet is um, pretty normal because our circulation slows down a little bit because of being pregnant. But also we sit a lot, so our bellies hang over our lymph nodes, which are right here. And especially if you sit and it cuts off the lymphatic and it gets kind of stuck and clogged. So we can have a lot of swelling in our feet and legs. So there's actually exercises that you can do to help unblock that. So the circulation will happen and the re retention of water will go away. Um, if the swelling is in your hands or your face, you need to talk to your provider about that. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple more and I'm going to call it. Wow, it's already 8.16. Y'all are good. Lots of questions. Okay, you're welcome, Ashlyn. Mult uh, multiples. I love this multiples. I've got twin mamas taking my train for birth workshop now, which is super exciting. So no, twins do not equal cesarean. Same thing with breach. It's a variation of normal. Your provider even has the skill set. Your provider doesn't. There are providers out there that will deliver twins vaginally, but you have to find them. They may or may not be in your area. I know exercising is good during pregnancy and to induce labor. Oh, wait. During pregnancy, and some people overdo it to induce labor. Is there a limit to how long you can walk towards the end of pregnancy, or is there such thing as overdoing it? Nope, no such thing. Your body is used to whatever you're doing with your body. If you're doing absolutely nothing, and then you go out and try to walk five miles, don't encourage that at all. You will be very sore, and that, that's... Pointless. But if you've been exercising and exercising and exercising, your body's used to it, so your body's going to respond better. Is there truth to being in water slowing down contractions if done too late? I encourage water. I don't care if it's you're not dilated or you're about ready to push a baby out. It's comforting. It's like the nature's epidural. Um, I know some people are like, don't do it. It slows contractions. Yes, it could, but it could be the rest you need to get back on the horse and keep going. So use it as a tool, whether it's in the tub or it's in the shower or wherever location you are. If you need a break and you want things to slow down or feel a little bit better, get in. Be in it for a while, maybe an hour, and then get out and get to work again. Okay, Use it to where it can help you labor and get through it. Should you be eating dates and pineapple, etc., to ripen your cervix at 36 weeks? No. Nope. Eating dates, I do recommend at 37 weeks. I swear by that, right? My mom's birthday is really fast, and that's part of the routine we have. Um, pineapple, mm, that's usually, that's, they have brolit, bromelain in it, and that causes, like, agitation of the digestive system that sits over the uterus, which can cause the uterus to be crampy. I think that's more of a myth. Works for some. Don't work for some. <laughs> this child is living in my ribs. Any suggestions? She is making it difficult to work. Oh, I'm sure she is. One, make sure your your chest is upright, right? But we, we want her to we want the feet up in the ribs. So what I would suggest, get up against a wall, put the ball between your wall and the back, and then lean back on the wall like this. Oh, right? So it opens like this and you can take some deep breaths and gives you some um relief okay okie dokie you guys so i'm going to end off it's 8 20. um thank you for spending your hour with me i'm super excited we had people all across the planet come in tonight remember this is your body your birth your baby healthy mommy healthy baby labor on if you need anything from me you can dm me I try to answer as many DMs as I can. It will not be tonight because I'm done for the day. <laughs> I'll be going to bed soon. And KrishaCrosley.com is my main 
website. It goes to all my other stuff. My Train for Birth website. Um, if you want to coach it, if you're a doula, you want doula training on January 21st. If you're a midwife and you want midwifery training on February 11th. Um, if you're an OB, talk to me. I'd love to train you too. But expecting parents is who I train the most. If you want a natural unmedicated birth, please train for it. I'm happy to help you with that. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your time being here, letting me share my knowledge with you, and for your generosity of sharing, tagging your friends. I have a huge goal in life to reach as many expecting parents on this planet as I can just to educate. My Facebook, social media, well, uh, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, all of that, that's all free information for anyone who wants to use it and glean my knowledge that I'm trying to share with you. So thank you very much for that. That helps me expand and also helps me reach my purpose of educating the world. Okay? All right. Look forward to training you soon. You'll have an email that goes out tomorrow night if you registered. If you haven't gotten it yet, the, the workshop or you registered during class. Um, but have a good night. Have a good morning or have a great day. See ya. You're very welcome. All of you.